In this video, I want to talk about the urea cycle in more detail. So in the last video, we talked about how we created carbamyl phosphate, which sort of started off this cycle. So that costed us two ATPs to actually make that carbamyl phosphate. The carbamyl phosphate is in the mitochondrial matrix of a liver cell. Now, in order for this carbamyl phosphate to move on to the urea cycle, it needs to join with this molecule here. This molecule here is called ornithine. Now, ornithine is an amino acid because it has an alpha carboxyl group here, an alpha amino group here, and an alpha hydrogen, and then an R group. So it's an amino acid, but you'll notice that it wasn't one that we talked about as being part of the 20 amino acids. And that's because it's not a proteogenic amino acid. It doesn't, it's not uh, coded for by the uh, codon table. So it's not incorporated in, into proteins. So that's why we didn't talk about it before, but it is an amino acid nonetheless. And it actually looks exactly like lysine, except it's one CH2 group shorter. So, ornithine is initially in the cytosol of the liver cell. It needs to get into the liver mitochondrial matrix in order to join with carbamyl phosphate. So it needs this little orange dot I've drawn here. It's a, a protein that allows it to trans transport into the mitochondrial matrix. So that is actually an ornithine transporter. Now, once that transporter gets ornithine into the mitochondrial matrix, it joins with carbamyl phosphate, and then a phosphate group pops off when, and this molecule here is created. This molecule is called citrulline. Now, citrulline basically just has the carbamyl portion of carbamyl phosphate tacked onto ornithine at this amino group here, which is what we have here. Now, citrulline is in the liver mitochondrial matrix. It needs to leave and get into the cytosol. In order to do that, in order to get out here, it needs this transporter here. That transporter is, of course, a citrulline transporter. Now, once that citrulline is out in the cytosol, we're going to use an ATP, turn it into a, a pyrophosphate. So that's the equivalent of two ATPs used there in this, in this step here. And we're going to create this molecule here, which is basically, which is called a citrullyl AMP. So it looks partly like citrulline and has an AMP on it. That's pretty much what it is. It's got the, mostly the citrulline here, except at this carbon up here, we have uh, an AMP attached to it. Now that is um, that citrullyl AMP. What we're going to add to it is this molecule here. This molecule is, you should recognize it as aspartate. Okay, um, so it has, this is an amino acid. It has the carboxyl group, amino group, H, and the R group. So I've labeled the, I've drawn the amino group here in blue. So once this uh, aspartate comes in to incorporate itself into the citrullyl AMP, the AMP actually hops off. And what we get is this aspartate attaches um, right here at that carbon. And then we get this molecule here. This molecule is now called arginosuccinate. Why is it called arginosuccinate? Well, let's think about this for a second. Argino should probably come from arginine, an amino acid that we've learned before. And succinate, we've seen that intermediate in the TCA cycle. So this portion here, you can tell, looks a lot like succinate, right? All it needs is this needs to be a CH2, so this can hop off as, as a succinate. And this portion here looks a lot like arginine, so it's just an arginine with a succinate attached to it. It's as simple as that. Arginosuccinate, what's going to happen to that is that the succinate is going to come off as a fumarate. Now that's important because this fumarate, you should know, um, is part of which uh, pathway that we've talked about before. This could go to the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle. And why is that important? Why would that be useful? Well, because we can get energy from this. We can get energy from that fumarate. So all the steps that after fumarate. So fumarate could actually yield us 1 NADH from the malate dehydrogenase step, which is the equivalent of 2.5 ATP. Why on earth is that useful or important? Because this 2.5 ATP will basically reduce the overall cost of the urea cycle because there's energy investments involved in the urea cycle, which we talked about just a moment ago. So that's important there. Now, once that fumarate hops off, then we should be left with this arginine here, which is actually what I've drawn here. 
So this is arginine. Arginine. Okay. So now arginine now has this red portion here from the carbamoyl phosphate and this blue portion here from the um, aspartate, which we've drawn over here. And then that portion right there is actually going to be uh, the part that hops off as urea. So we add water and get this portion to hop off as urea. And then that arginine regenerates this ornithine, which can is now ready for another round of the cycle. So, of course, this product here, this urea, where does that thing go? Well, it is excreted, right, as a waste product. It is excreted either in the urine or sweat. So that's pretty much it. As a sort of general recap and overview, where in the body is all of this happening? Which organ? It's happening in the liver. But where in the cell specifically does the urea cycle occur? Well, some steps occur in the mitochondrial matrix. And some, the rest of it occurs in the cytosol. Furthermore, um, carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1, uh, or CPS1, is the uh, first committed step, which is something we've talked about before. It's the first committed step, and it's actually um, highly regulated. It re regulates the flux of nitrogen through the cycle. Oops. So it's highly regulated, excuse me. And specifically, it's the flux of nitrogen uh, is regulated at this step. Right, the step in which the carbamyl, the carbamyl phosphate is actually made. Hope that video was helpful. Mm -hmm.